Well, good morning. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you out of Romans 12 today, so if you want to uh, pull out your phones and go there, you're welcome to. Guys everywhere just started updating their fantasy football lineup. Um, kidding, because you're pulling out the phone. All right, sorry. Um, but I want to give you some background stuff right before we kind of uh, dive into the passage. We're really going to work through the whole chapter of Romans 12. Um, but before we do, I kind of want to share with you a few uh, stuff that I've been, I want to bring to the table as we, no pun intended, as we discuss, um, as we enter this, this, this um, plug in the, in the series that we're in to call Table. And these are a few verses and a few things that have been floating around in, in my head and my heart as I was kind of preparing. And from the very beginning, in Genesis uh, 1 and 2, where we, where we see God creating, and he says, let us make man in our image. And coming straight from those verses, the, the, the word that they use for God there is Elohim, which in nature is actually uh, plural for, for the Hebrew language. So we can see from the very beginning that God was, uh, from the creation chapters, that God has always um, been about like community, like we think of, we really think of God as like singular most often when we say it, but we've all heard, and I don't think any of us completely understand, but we've all wrestled with the concept of the Trinity, and when John 1, 1, right, in the beginning was the word, all that, Jesus is the word, right, so, all right, you guys with me? Cool. So, from the very beginning, God has been about community, and when we were fashioned in his image, I think a huge part of that is relationship. So even when we come to church, what's actually most important isn't necessarily what I want. It's, it becomes about everybody around us, right? So it's really funny when we make church about like me, like they didn't play the song that I wanted or the, right? Because it really should be about the people sitting around us, not about ourselves. All right, sorry. Anyway, okay. I'm about to get stoned up here. I can feel it. Um, And then the next verse I want to throw at you before we jump into Romans 12 is Psalm 23. It's a passage we've all um, heard read many times probably. But in verse 5 it says, God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. So we have this imagery of, and, and it's funny because every commentary I read was basically like, you know, God's preparing a table for you so your enemies can, like, look on and realize that, like, God's for you and they're missing out kind of a thing. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But before we do, I want to tell you a story. I was, uh, I travel and fish. My wife and I go all across the country. And a couple weeks ago, we were in Alabama fishing on Lake Gunnersville, and we had a camera guy out with us. And I never really know when, like, like, God's going to just totally interrupt everything and, like, drop a bomb on me. Y'all y'all experience that at all ever? All right, so I'm, like, totally fishing, like, camera guy's on the boat, and he, like, uh, says something that completely sucked me out of the fishing world for a moment, and, like, I was like, oh, my goodness, dude, that's, like, that's truth. And, like, you ever been, like, in a moment where somebody just says something, and you're like, dude, I feel the Lord on that. That was, that was like, insane. Um, So I had one of those moments, and what he said was, he said, what I've learned is that if we're not careful, the more we own, the more stuff ends up owning us. And I was like, dude, that's like good. And here's the crazy thing, is I didn't know his story completely, but we get to dinner that night, and I found out that he basically was really well off, like, um, had a really well-established business, was doing all this uh, kind of stuff, and kind of sold it all to pursue what he loved, which was film. And so he, wor- he like, works with, like, Nat Geo and, like, some of these, like, huge things, right? But he says to me, he says, I love working with the guys here at Big Best Tour because I just love the guys. I just love, like, I love being around you guys. And I just thought how crazy it is that, like, we can shape our lives around stuff like relationship that matters or stuff that doesn't matter, like stuff. You with me? All right, so I'm gonna dive into uh, Romans 12 now. 
And I think taking that into this will help us unpack it a little bit. And Paul says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We got some worshipers around here. People like worship, right? So this is your true and proper worship. Are you ready? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. All right, so think about this with me. The pattern of this world. What is the pattern of this world when you look around? The pattern of this world that I tend to see and that Paul kind of gets to at the bottom of this chapter where we're heading is kind of that eye for an eye mentality. You wrong me, I'm gonna pay you back. Or even like, like I was just talking about, like you can pursue stuff, you can pursue, right, you with me? So like those are kind of the patterns of this world. We can get totally consumed and wrapped up in giving people what they deserve because it feels good, you know? I mean, I've seen some of y'all drive. I know you. It's okay. I'm kidding. All right. Let's keep going. I'm going to jump down now to Romans 12, 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share the Lord's people, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. This is where we get to the fun stuff. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now, when Paul goes here, I think he's totally pulling this from the example he saw in Jesus. Tell me this isn't like exactly what Jesus did, right? So we have, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. So Paul's really saying here, meet people where they're at. Is that not what Jesus did? Meet people where, we're, where they're at. So Paul's inviting us to do it God's way. And God's way often doesn't necessarily feel good. When I look at, when I was preparing for this uh, table series and looking at all the different um, stories in the Bible where we have uh, tables and all this kind of stuff, one that, that popped out to me was uh, the story of Zacchaeus and how, you know, he like climbs this tree to see Jesus and we have this whole thing and Jesus is like, you, I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus was like literally like despised and hated tax collector. And to be a tax collector back then, you're pretty much a sellout. Like he was basically like stealing money from his peers, essentially. You know what I mean? So when, for Jesus to single him out and say, I'm coming to your house today, I mean, It was a big deal, and it probably made a lot of other people not super cool with it. You know what I mean? They're like, he's going to his house, dude. Why isn't he coming to my house? Look what I do. All right, anyway, sorry. So Jesus singles him out, (laughs) and just a few verses later, we see Zacchaeus say, I'm going to pay back everything I've stolen with, like, interest. I'm going to, like, go over, beyond, above, give everything away, and Jesus is like, surely the gospel has reached, or salvation even, has reached his house today, right? So we have that picture versus like, I, I thought of immediately of the rich young ruler after that who is like, God, I've done everything right. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, I've done it all. What do, what do I need, what do I need to, to do? And it's so funny to me how, like, how Jesus never really wants to like, answer that question. You know what I mean? It's like we see Jesus kind of avoiding it through the whole thing with him. Like, well, have you done this? Have you done this? And finally, Jesus is like, you know what, dude? Just sell everything and come follow me. And he can't do it. 
But what's funny is when the kingdom found Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was like, ah, I'm just going to give it all away, dude. I'm, I'm in. And is that not how like the kingdom is? When it finds us, we, like, we got to go all in. There's no option. It's, it's like when God's kingdom finds our hearts, it's an all in moment. It's not like, well, I think, you know, might have, I might should, uh, we'll try it, you know. Anyway, didn't work out super well for the rich young ruler, I guess. But anyway, I guarantee you God still kept pursuing him, though. God's pursuit of humanity absolutely blows my mind. So, let's keep going now. Uh, Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Man, but it feels good though, doesn't it? Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Remember that verse we just read in Psalm? How God was preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies? And like Jesus asked us to love our enemies. And then here we have Paul. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Is that not the model that we have? Because is that not Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them? I mean... That's the example that was set for us. And it it is God's nature. You see, God's nature is not one of, God doesn't ever repay evil for evil. That would make God like not good, right? What makes God's character and nature good is that he doesn't ever repay evil for evil. And it's so funny that we we can get so wrapped up in like, we just want God in power so bad, I think sometimes, that we forget how his power like happens. God's power, so like, (laughs) when we start to think about it and realize it, like, okay, Jesus conquered death, but how did he conquer it? He died. Dude, dying doesn't look like a win to to the disciples. And in fact, 11 of the disciples were pretty much running for their lives at that point. Running for their lives probably felt way more like an L. There were some teams that took L's yesterday, surprised people. But running for their lives, college football joke, all right, I'm sorry. Running for their lives probably didn't feel like a win. You with me right now? That probably felt like a loss in the moment. And God's kingdom comes, God conquered death through death. He didn't avoid it. You see, God's kingdom, or how God works is like, so God doesn't run from evil. So like, here's the crazy thing. Jesus said that the cross was a cup to be received from his father's table. What? So like, Jesus chose to receive a cup of suffering from the table? Two weeks. We're gonna talk about that two weeks. Come back two weeks, we're gonna talk about it. But anyway, so Jesus receives it as a cup? Like, chooses to go... He doesn't run from evil. God doesn't run from evil. And he doesn't just like avoid it to conquer it. He goes through it. So what's he gonna do with our lives, right? And we start to think about how God's kingdom work. I was talk, I was um, having lunch with one of my really good friends, Madison, and we were just talking about how God's kingdom like prevails in the earth. And we started to like look at people's lives who um, did it Jesus's way and what it cost them. So it was like, as we were like thinking about even like Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and like really doing it God's way through weakness, choosing to love our enemies in ultimate weakness. It's funny how resistant people are to like God's kingdom, isn't it? As far as like when we start to love our enemies and not just give people what they deserve. When we do it God's way, it like they killed him for it. You know what I mean? And they killed Jesus for it. 
The world doesn't know how to re respond when we show them love when they don't deserve it. They don't know what to do with it. They're like, uh, this is, what? You, so like, God's preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies, and instead of pointing at them being like, ah, nanny nanny boo boo, like you're missing out. What if we do what Paul is saying here, and if our enemy is hungry, we feed him. If he is thirsty, we give him something to drink. And then now all of a sudden, instead of looking into the eyes of our enemy, now we're looking into the eyes of a friend. It changes, it changes things. You see, when we start to love our enemy, and God is love, what happens in that moment? Now our enemy is experiencing God's love. Now they're experiencing God's mercy. <laughs> Even though it started off as God's gift to us, now it's God's gift to them. And now we're taking our seat at the table. Because you see, as the Trinity is in ultimate relationship and we enter into that relationship moment with them over what God is speaking over creation, it's insane what God's gonna do. Like that's how the world's gonna be changed. They're not gonna be changed through like, oh, we're just gonna, you know, it's, we're eye for an eye, man. We can't help it, dude. Like, we get cut off in traffic. We want revenge, you know what I mean? We get, we get bloodlust out there. I've seen you. It's me too. I get it. But, but it's, it's, it happens in a moment. And we can either choose to take our seat at the table as part of the body of Christ and love the people around us, or we can totally, you know, it's so funny because, like, God's way is so uncomfortable, and it chat like it's easy to understand. We can understand it, but when it comes time to practice, my goodness, we would much rather just follow religion, wouldn't we? We're just like we turn just like into the rich young ruler. Well, God, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. I'll do it. He's like, oh, okay. Well, it's going to cost you everything because it requires us giving up. <laughs> being right sometimes. You know, our brain is a binary system. So basically what that means is when, when you take in a piece of information, you're either, if it affirms your ego, you're either go, that's good. If it disaffirms your ego, it does not affirm your ego, you're like, ah, bad. Pretty quick. And it's, we do this in blinks, this fast. Boom, affirm, disaffirm. Uh, and if, if we're not careful, we... Perhaps our enemy just didn't affirm our ego. It wasn't that they were even wrong. Perhaps they just, we didn't even just like the way they did something. You know what I mean? It was, they didn't affirm us. And so we're like, oh, I don't like them. Why don't you like them? I don't know. I just don't like them. Did you love them? I don't know. Well, if we want to see God's love in the earth today, we've got to take our seat at the table. And we've got to be willing to see who God's placed in our lives around us who's also supposed to sit at our table or who God's calling to sit at our table. Because here's the thing with Jesus. Do you know who was at his table? Betrayer, denier. And he served both of them, his body and his blood, and said it was broken for them. Think about that for a second. So now all of a sudden, not only does, is Jesus not giving them what they deserve. It's so funny though, because we're like, oh, I don't, it's such a hot button. I'm not gonna hit it. It'll just get, it'll get too bad. I won't do it. I won't do it to you. Whew, I felt it in a moment. If you want to talk to me after, we can talk about it. I'm going to resist the urge. Because um, I'll be misunderstood. It's not that my heart's not right. It'll just be misunderstood. But the willingness to not have to be right all the time, but to have, take the seat at the table meet people where they're at. It's what Jesus did. You see, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. He ate with sinners to the point where they were calling Jesus a drunk. Right? So like, if that's what they're calling Jesus, if that's how far he was willing to take it, so do you know how far Jesus pursued humanity? Jesus pursued humanity to hell to get the keys, Right? So like when Jesus died, we say he went to hell to get the keys for death, hell, and the grave, right? So when Jesus was willing to go 
to hell for humanity. So now there's nowhere that God isn't. Man, that gets complicated quick, doesn't it? I'm sorry. Just, I don't know. Just talk to me after. I know I'm raising a lot of questions right now. Bear with me. But doing it God's way comes at a cost. There's a price. But as we start to allow people to our table who don't necessi- we don't necessarily like, and we choose to love them where they are, not where they should be, God's love is in, the, is in that moment. And that's what we're called to do. If we're going to be amb- ambassadors of his love on this earth and be people that are actively engaging in his kingdom, seeing restoration happen, we gotta take our seat at the table. So I'm gonna tell you one more story as I close. You know, it, it, it's funny too because there's no doubt that this is how Jesus chose to overcome. Jesus never chose to overcome evil for evil. <laughs> he always, over, and he's our example. He, God always overcomes evil with good, doesn't he? It's crazy to me. We're like, yeah, but God's going to, like, take vengeance out on all my enemies. I don't know, bro. I don't think God would ask us to love our enemies if he's not going to do the same in the end. But that's just me. So Heather and I are out on the boat um, uh, on a Friday morning. And the tournament started on Saturday. And we're out there before the sun was coming up. And uh, I was starting on a place where I was, like, determined, like, this is going to be the spot where I start tomorrow. This place has got fish. We caught one that almost won it here, like, just a couple years ago. I was like, without a doubt, this is the spot we need to be in. So I'm, like, really trying to find them. Like, I'm look, staring at the graph so hard. Like, I'm, I'm not seeing any fish on it. It's not going well. And Heather's in the back of the boat, like, this is amazing. Like, Look at this beautiful sunrise. Like, like she's totally having a moment with the Lord back there. Like, God is so big, isn't he? Like, she's totally just admiring the sunrise. And I'm at the, up at the front of the boat, like, trying to catch a fish, kind of getting annoyed at the fact that she's having a moment. I'm like, that's good. I'm happy for you. But if you could just take that moment and keep it back there, I, I got, like, 30 minutes but, but like window here where we're going to try and make this happen. So if you could just contain it, because she was like, stop and look, look at this, look at this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good, it's good, yeah. And, but, so like 30 minutes later goes by, and I did not catch a fish. And I was been totally ready to participate in the sunrise in that moment. But you know what had already happened? Sun had already come up. I completely missed the sunrise moment. Completely missed it. It happened. And you see, God's kingdom, these moments are happening to us every day. And we can sit there in it and say, ah, just 30 minutes, God. I need, just give me, I just need, I gotta finish this. I'm working on this. This is what I'm doing. If you could just give me this time. But you see, life happens in such a way where it's happening whether we choose for it to happen or not. It's, gonna, it's happening. The sun's coming up. We're in the sunrise moment. And we can either jump into what God's actively doing in a moment when we are presented with an opportunity, we can step into it, or we, you can be like me on the front of the boat saying, if you could just give me like 30 minutes, you know what I mean? But here's the, here's the, here's the amazing thing. If you completely miss it, guess what's gonna happen tomorrow? The sun's gonna come up tomorrow. You're gonna have another opportunity. But don't wait, because the moment's now, too. Don't miss the sunrise that happened today. You don't have to wait for the moment. It's happening. But if you missed it, it's all right. Tomorrow the sun's gonna come up. God's gonna give you another opportunity to participate in his kingdom. Somebody else in your life is gonna be in a situation perhaps or whatever it is. But every day we have an opportunity to engage with what God's doing around us or not. 
So I invite you this morning, maybe, um, maybe you're in a place where you just need to forgive some people. Listen, we don't forgive because people deserve it. <laughs> people, nobody deserves it. I don't deserve it. But we forgive because, like, God's asked us to do that. And he forgave us, right? So, like, if we want to live free lives, we got to be willing to forgive. That's a big deal. If we want to see real change happen on this earth, in our city, in the world around us, in the people's lives around us, we're going to have to be willing to get hurt and continue to forgive and continue to sit at the table and to look in the eyes of our enemy with a heart of love and wait for God to enter their moment. Because here's the thing. What's it say right after? It says, and if they reject it, it's like heaping burning coals on their head. So basically, if you're offering your enemy food and you're offering your enemy drink and they reject it, they're choosing to die perhaps in the desert. At some point, they're going to go, uh, I'm, I'm too thirsty, dude. I, gotta, I, I need something to drink. They're going to come to the table. Or they're going to choose death. And I think this is how God's kingdom works in a lot of ways. God's not out to, like, smite people for their sin. God is standing open invitation. And we are to do the same. God's heart is for people. Is our heart for people? Is our heart for the world around us? Do we love with that kind of reckless love, willing to take a knock and willing to get hurt in the process. How many know loving people hurts, man? People are gonna hurt you. But this is how God has invited us to live. So this morning, I want you to find that heart space, that meeting place of the heart, and say to the Lord to yourself, oh, God, I, if you need to forgive, tell him, or if you want to be forgiven even. Maybe if you ask the Lord to forgive you. And in doing that, what I want you to do is this time, because confession is a powerful thing. If there's something you're holding on to, give it to the Lord, but I want you to wait to hear him say, I forgive you. It's really, really easy to just like ask for forgiveness and not wait to hear him say, I forgive you. You know what I mean? Like, God, forgive me. And then we just move on. It's a relationship. Listen, to, listen for the voice of the Lord in your life. And tomorrow and the rest of today, look for opportunities to love his world. But go to that heart place right now. Forgive, ask for forgiveness, and just take a second to commune with the Lord as we close the service.